All right, welcome everyone to another episode of Vinny Presents. Today we have actor, producer, writer, my friend from New York, Mr. Frank Mancuso. Frank, welcome to the program. Good morning, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's uh, something that I'm really was really looking forward to all week, and I can't wait to let all the guests know about all your wonderful adventures. But Frank, let's get started. First and foremost, tell everybody where you're from and how you got started in the business. All right, I'm a. I live here in Queens, but I'm originally from upstate New York, and I came down uh, to New York in 1983 to pursue my dream of uh, becoming an actor. Um, well, you know, trying to struggle as an actor like everybody else. I worked uh, a couple jobs. One of them was uh, doing security at Madison Square Garden, Yankee Stadium, Shea Stadium back in the day. Uh, it allowed me a lot of flexibility to do what I was doing. And then uh, acting really didn't pan out for a while. So then I uh, got into law enforcement. Uh, I was a court officer with the Mount Vernon Police Department. Then I worked for the NYPD uh, as an evidence and property specialist. And then I became a deputy uh, deputy sheriff in the city of New York. And then uh, basically once I retired, I decided to uh, get back into it full time. But the only problem was, uh, you know, I lost a lot of touch with a lot of the old contacts and agents and stuff. So the only kind of work I was getting was uh, predominantly just background work. And uh, I met my buddy, Chris uh, Adams on the set of elementary who had a script called blue iron. And I said, why don't we produce this ourselves?" And basically that, you know, led into everything else. And we just started uh, making our own projects. And then between me and him, we just started writing a lot of projects. And currently I'm up to 15 screenplays. Beautiful, beautiful, man. Listen, I, I um, love watching all your posts, by the way, right for all our guests, make sure you're following Frank. He's on their Calabrian Kate on Instagram, and uh, you'll you'll see all of his posts. Now let's dial it back just a little bit because you did do security and you were around. You did help protect a lot of famous people, including Telly Savalas, right? Um, was it Sinatra too? Tell us, tell us some of the famous people that you, you helped protect. Um, yes, basically, um, pretty much because of the contacts that I made uh, working at the Garden Shea Stadium stuff. Um, I got employed uh, through a gentleman named Joe Cirillo, who owned Film World Security, and he pretty much he had all the contracts of all the celebrities that came into uh, New York. And one of the biggest one was Frank Sinatra, which I would do every time he came into New York uh, in the 80s. And I would work uh, basically right outside his door at the Waldorf Astoria um, Hotel. And then basically his sets, like uh, if they were on set, I'd be with Al Pacino um uh, william hurt um sam elliott um basically and then of course joe was a private security guard uh private uh, security for telly savalas um i worked with telly savalas in a film called um uh, justice for all it was a uh, cbs made for a movie i played a security guard and then i got to meet him a lot uh he was a big fan of tennis so he would come to the garden and i got to know telly there and stuff great guy uh, what a, a really uh, one of the best gentlemen from the old school of Hollywood. Uh, so I got to meet a lot of interest in people. Can you tell us a little bit? Like, did you were you able? I know it's when you're working. It wasn't a lot of people aren't very like on the they're in the, they're on the inside, but they're not that close to a lot of celebrities per se because you're working. But did you have any interaction with Pacino or with Sinatra? That that anything? Any cool stories or anything that? Oh, yeah. Like I said, I mean, both of them were very nice. Uh, Frank, uh, those are stories that uh, um, you're right outside his door. So uh, basically, you have to stop everybody that comes there. Um, like Brooke Shields came there. Sammy Davis came there. Uh, one of the best stories that I have, uh, which I you know, eventually told Joe, was there was a gentleman that always took a suite right next to um, Frank Sinatra. And he would always come out and said, hey, uh, listen, dinner's on me. I have a couple of girls coming up uh, next door. Uh, just do me a favor. Let them in. Just knock on the door and let them in. They're coming for me and stuff. So he would give me a nice little dinner just to uh, make sure his escorts were uh, <laughs> were coming to entertain him for the, uh, for the weekend and stuff. Wow. But one of the uh, most uh, craziest one was when a uh, so-called associate uh, from Jersey came. 
And uh, basically, he got a little upset that uh, he had to wait outside Sinatra's suite for about an hour and kept pacing back and forth and does he know who i am and stuff and and then uh finally we let him in and he was a, a pussycat once he was inside <laughs> <laughs> of course yep so now what made you decide to then go full force into the writing into the the the, the acting and the production part of things a lot of it was uh Kind of just basically trying to see if I could do it. Um, you know, you had your one of your other interviews on, and he said that uh, he was late in the uh, business when he started writing at 30. I didn't start till my mid-50s um, writing. And um, that was the very first uh, script that I wrote was Stain. Um, I had written it years ago, but it was outdated. So I had to bring it back up to uh, modern times. And, of course, I uh, went out to Las Vegas, which I posted uh and that one best action uh, screenplay at the uh, Las Vegas International Film and Screenplay Awards, which is the Mega Awards. And, you know, that's an honor because it's only once a year. Um, and basically it was just a confidence thing. And then um, I wrote a couple more and then it just kind of started working. And I realized that I actually did have talent to write. Um, so now it's like um, it's gotten much easier. Um, Submitting them to films, uh, to the film um, festivals, uh, was very depressing in the beginning because I kept getting, you know, not selected, you know, denied. Uh, you know, these are just writers' mistakes, you know, that I was making um, that I didn't really get to know until I read that book that I sent you, uh, basically to help me correct uh, some what they call uh, structural um things that needed to be corrected to make it a proper uh, thing because you had to use final draft too uh as as the proper form uh, as a writer so once i started learning uh, all the different techniques um it just became a little bit easier and then just stories just started popping out of my head and having real life experiences uh as i as i have as a writer uh, i mean as a, as an officer um you know working for the police departments and working at the garden I just use real life experiences uh, and I put them into the uh, story. So it sounds very legit, you know, so if I do a court scene, uh, the court scene, you know, as per the procedures and stuff, they're real. And that's what really um, makes it the script uh, a little bit more valid. Yeah. The old adage, you know, write with write what you know. And exactly right. What you know, exactly. And that's, that's the, uh, the beauty of having that. Um, that experience that you, you've had because like I tell everybody, because I'm, I'm an amateur uh, screenwriter. In fact, I'm trying to download final draft and I can't get it downloaded. I think I have a corrupt file, <laughs> but anyway, Oh damn. Um, I was using it. Well, there's that, there's a couple of new, I have chapter uh, final ch uh, chapter 11. They have final draft 12 and I believe they just came out with 13, which I'm not doing because then I have to learn everything all over again. And I'm not too computer savvy as my wife would tell you. So once I, I I know something, I stay with the same system. I'm old school. What can I tell you? <laughs> no, me too. Hey, listen, I have copy books everywhere, you know, but it is easier, obviously, when you can dictate or just, you know, use the, the computer. But um, it is a beautiful thing when you start to start typing and you start things to start to unravel and you get them out of your mind and onto the, onto the either paper or computer. But it is satisfying. But I, I, I agree with what you said and I identify with what you said as far as the confidence factor. Um, I had written something many years ago that I thought was kind of outdated. But I, I showed it to a friend of mine, Neil Gumpel, who's a, a Hollywood screenwriter. He's yeah, Hollywood. that was the, yeah, that was a gentleman that I watched some of the interview with. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's, Neil's a great guy. He lives in Tennessee now. But he uh, I always like to say he survived Hollywood, which was, you know, just a lot of stories uh, that he can't tell, tell us. But... With, with that being the case, he was one of the first people, who, him and his partner, Andrea, they read it. And um, he told me, he's like, you know, he's like, you're a writer. He's like, this is amazing. He's like, this is really good. So, and he didn't know me well enough at that time to give me those compliments just for the, you know, I wasn't giving him money or anything like that. He just was, you know, being very friendly. Right. So that gave me a little, uh, a little confidence boost, uh, as you said. And so. It is it is a beautiful thing to to be able to to create something out of really just your mind and just like an architect, just like anyone who's creative. 
Uh, now, let's. it's important to mention, too, that you are a SAG member, right? You've been with SAG since, what, 85? Yes. And um, being an actor for all these years and being able to see all different ends of the business, whether you're writing, you're acting, you're producing, what do you think would be some of your... In, like, what are some of your, your proudest moments, either as an actor, or as a writer, or a producer? Well, um, as an actor, just getting to work with certain people. I mean, some of the people, like when I worked on Gotham with uh, Ben McKenzie and Lonnie, um, pure gentlemen, pure professionals. Um, certain other people, you know, like I, I've worked with a lot of people, as you could see that when I posted, you know, Joe Kenascoli from The Sopranos, I've worked with um you know telly savalas you know which was an honor for me um you know i've been in jack uh, you know different movies pritzy's honor with uh, jack nicholson a couple other but like i said um just different things i've been on soap operas you know i'm always just a character actor which is fine you know sometimes a small role one line sometimes just more featured and stuff which is fine but uh, uh the idea of what it, for me the most proudest moment was um learning the process uh on blue iron um i had to you know you got to wear multiple hats uh, as you're as you're learning yourself now uh when you're a producer you have to worry about everything uh from the beginning from the casting to locations uh catering um, props um you know all these uh, locations that you have to set up for all these different things and getting all getting all the people there at the same time and making sure that you know, things are rehearsed and stuff like that. Um, and then just the whole completion of it and then into post-production um, and then, you know, setting up the premieres and, and stuff. That was a, a really hard but enjoyable learning process for me because you, you took a project basically from paper and you put it onto film. So when you do that, that's like, um, that's an accomplishment itself, whether, you know, uh, successful or not the idea is that taking something from you know a, a piece of paper and pen and putting it up on the screen and seeing it you know that's awesome man you know it's you just learn so much because then you kind of appreciate um all the steps that you have to do i mean these are hours and hours and you know plus i had to travel down to um uh, your your part of the town down to philly and into Trenton, New Jersey, where we filmed all this, you know, so we had to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time down there, stay away from family, you know, uh, spend a couple of nights down there, you know, filming locations, uh, dealing with problems on set, you know, stuff like that. It's it's a learning process, you know, legal stuff, uh, trying to get, uh, you know, uh, securing locations and, um, you know, just making sure everybody was there. So it, it's a, it's being a producer. It was much harder than I thought, you know, because you have to be there every day to make sure from the beginning to end that everything is done. And that also making sure that the um, shots that you shot were completed, um, making sure that there's continuity, um, you know, because I, then I started like also taking pictures of everybody with my, you know, with my own phone of everybody, what they were wearing to make sure that, you know, for continuity, they were saying, okay, you were wearing this, you were wearing this. You know things that you know how you always watch in a movie. Say, oh wait, he he had a he had a pink jacket on, or he had a you know a different kind of jacket on, or he had a pink tie, and people notice those things. So you you, be, you become very conscious of those type of uh, things as a, as a first time producer. Yeah, it's funny how you you do notice those little things, you know, and and that's why it's it, it's important continuity, script supervision. There's a lot of things that. Oh man, there's so many things that go into it. And I'm just getting my feet wet with my buddy Sal as far as being a producer and for a project that's coming up. But man, you're right. You know, all the different policy and legalities and, and you gotta, you know, organization, the whole organization of it. There's so many moving parts, but a lot oh, of yeah, well, that, that, so that, that that's the thing that like when you're an actor, you basically say, Okay, I'm here, you know, where do you want me to sit? You sit down over there, you're learning your lines, and then you call me when you need me. When you're the producer, you're, you know, you're running basically with that chicken without a head because you're making sure that this shot is set up. What's next? You know, what, what do we need? 
Um, you know, so and so is not there. Hey, you know that uh, that picture was moved. You moved it. You got to put it back. You know, a whole bunch of different things. So it, it's so each each time you do a new film, you've gotten better at it, but you have to you, you kind of now more focus your mind on the on the small little things than the whole project itself because those little things could screw things up because a couple times we, we were like oh did you guys do the close-up no oh wait you didn't do the reverse shots no we're like oh man so yeah and sometimes you need to bring people back yes one of the things i will definitely tell you as a secret um that we learned on audio was definitely uh, on our third film because we after the first and second films, something called ADR. After each scene, at the end of the day, put everybody in a room, nice and quiet, put the mic in the middle, and have everybody do their lines. So this way, if there's any mistake or any uh, noise background that you hear on your while you're filming, you can clean it up through ADR because you re-recorded it, um, uh, you know, nice and quiet. So this way you have a nice clean cut. That's one of the tips of the day. I like that. Yeah, it's a good, that's a really good idea. I know we were discussing like the, um, I forget what it's called, but you can, you can actually, when you do a scene, you can actually view it as, it's, as, you know, as, as you, as you finish. Yeah. It right there. Yeah. So like I said, if you, if you want, like I said, uh, after you're done filming, make sure the actor repeats the same dialogue the same way he did in the scene. Cause if I say, you know, hey, Vinny, you know, what about this? But if it was, yo, Vinny, what the fuck? You know, with the same enthusiasm. So you have to say, oh, I apologize. But uh, <laughs> basically, you have to say the same thing with the same tone and the same manner. Right. So that's one of the things that, uh, again, as a, as a producer, you're learning all these little tricks that will help you later on uh later on during the uh what we call post-production part of the uh of the uh production because when you're putting it together you want a nice clear audio sound right right right. now the the good news is too that you are in new york that's you know one of the hot, hottest places to be involved in in the uh the movie industry of course yeah. second maybe to hollywood so is there a lot i'm sure there's a lot more opportunity now obviously after covid and everything things slowed down but now is the city bustling with different projects? Yeah, they're starting to pick up. Actually, they were filming Blue Bloods uh, not too far from their house. Uh, they're picking up. Um, I just started going back on Actors Access, started looking to see myself if there's any work for me. Of course, I don't do background work. Um, so if any actor or casting directors are looking for a big Italian guy, here I am. Uh, I'm available here in New York. Um, but uh, I don't know. Right now, like I said, I'm trying more focused on uh, doing my own projects. Uh, like I said, I have two scripts uh, that we definitely want to do, The Vagrant and The Sicilians. And right now I'm in post-production of a, uh, a an Italian documentary called Sony Le Italiano, which I uh, submitted a trailer to the Russo brothers, uh, hoping to get uh, selected on that because it's a, it talks a little bit about uh, the Italian history, um, a little bit like a migration, but it also talks about um how we actually got columbus day it wasn't uh, uh to honor columbus day it was really to uh as an appeasement for what happened in new orleans in 1891 of the hanging of 11 italians so it was an atrocity so italy and the u.s almost went to war in 1891 people don't know that so part of uh an appeasement under uh president franklin harris they, they said okay we'll honor the italians by giving us columbus day so we came up with this uh, thing. None of us knew about it. I didn't know it as an Italian American, and uh, so we're trying to create a little uh, um, educational to you know educate not only Americans but uh, uh, American Italians as well. Well, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, I didn't even know that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, like I said, actually, when you get off um, when we're done, look it up. The most uh, lynchings in one day was eleven Italians in New Orleans. And exactly. it's not the first time. All they they lynched a lot of Italians in the South up to like 1920. I believe the last one was 1920 in Tampa, Tampa, Florida. Wow. 
sad, man. But that's nice that you're bringing it to light. You know, it's things that you, you have to remember what people struggle through. You know. And, well, yeah, like I said, uh, these this was something that um, uh, came about uh, accidentally. Uh, learning about it, and Chris and I decided to uh, create something. Uh, and then, of course, we went up to the Bronx to talk to a lot of um, um, store owners, how their families came here and they started their business, you know, in the Bronx, like in the early 1920s and how it's been passed over to their family and how tradition is still being kept, you know, between the food, the cultures and stuff like that. And that's one of the things that we're doing. Yeah, I, I've been invited to the Bronx so many times. I still haven't made it up, but I'm, I'm looking forward to some really great people up there. Yeah, absolutely. Not that, but you go to the uh, to Mike's to the marketplace where you got everything up there. All the Italian great sandwiches. I could take you. Oh, you'll love the Calabrian store. I mean, there's a place there that's got so much super soft and stuff hanging up from the ceiling from the I door to the door. <laughs> yes, I may I may never want to come home. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Forget it. You better you better bring a, a pickup truck because you'll take so much back. I can just I can just imagine the smell when you walk in. Oh my! Well, see, I we grew up we uh, grew up making that stuff, so yeah, you know yeah. I, I know. Like I said, we had it in our garage, hang it up, and you know we made the homemade wine and everything yeah. else. You know the <laughs> olives, you know the super sata, the, the doing the tomatoes because you know as a young kid, my you know I, I was the one that always had to do the cranking on the machine. <laughs> yeah, us too. We uh, you know we get the Jersey tomatoes, and I, I still make it. You know, I, I make it. Oh, do you? Two, make it every two years. We have a nice. Uh, there's a nice farm. Uh, owned by Italians in, in South Jersey and Vineland, and the tomatoes are huge. You know, they're beautiful. Oh, yeah. Very, and it's all, it's they're perfect. They're like um, all pulp. You know, they're just yep. meaty. There's a there's actually a tomato. I mean, we're getting off track here, but there's a tomato that's really, really good that I encourage everybody to look into. It's called Soldaki, S-O-L-D-A-K-I. And it's really like, they're, they look like the size of like grapefruits, and they're very meaty. They're just awesome to make uh, sauce or gravy, as we call it here. But oh, really? Fun. We got a conflict because it's only sauce <laughs> talk. You know where gravy? Actually, I got another thing for you. When you get done, you Google why it's called it's sauce and why. You know how you got gravy? The you know meat. how and why? The meat, pro probably. I don't know. No, no. Back when the Italians came over. And they were trying to uh, assimilate with the Americans. The Americans would invite, invite them over and said, come on over to our house and have some turkey and gravy. So the Italians, in order to explain to them, they said, well, come on over and try our gravy. And you have it with pasta and our meat. But if that's it's uh, gravy is what we call a second or third generation term that was used to assimilate. If you actually you can Google that up, and that's a fact as well, because it's been sauced. It's always been sauced because it comes from zucchero, which is from the, you know, the uh, tomatoes and stuff. That's that's really cool. You know, I listen. I um, come on. What kind of color breads are you that you don't know this stuff? This I, is your history. Well, they used to my. I, don't, I you know I don't even know how they did that. Like, I, I, it's not like it's really widespread. I think it's mostly like South Jersey, maybe Philly. I don't really know of any other town that calls it gravy it is kind of strange i call i call it both i call it sauce like i'll say i made the gravy sauce. is brown gravy that you put on meat sauce <laughs> is sauce because there's meat in it to cook it but it's always red find me a jar that says when you buy at the store it always says a jar of sauce it doesn't say gravy <laughs> you're right hey listen you're right i you know and it's the funny thing is too if I if I were if I wasn't from Philly I'd probably be like what the hell are they talking about <laughs> yes you would yeah, but actually, if you look it up, um, it, it was basically an association to um, uh, Italian Americans to assimilate to American culture, and that's how the best way they could explain to uh, the Americans, like you know, you come over and you know you can try some of ours, and it was just a term that was easier because you it kept saying sauce, they were like, what sauce? You know, it's red sauce. They were saying, oh, but uh, how about you? You you know what? That's gravy. Oh, yeah, I'll try your gravy. And that's how it turned out. <laughs> like a red gravy, yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I, um, I, I, but I share a lot of the same passions, the homemade wine, the stuff. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's stuff that you gotta, you gotta keep the traditions going. Oh, um, absolutely. Now, now, now Frank, going back to entertainment, though, because now you, you're making me hungry with all this talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go back to entertainment. So what what are you what are you looking to achieve in the next five ten years? 
Oh, basically, wow, that's that's a good one. Um, basically, to just be a an accomplished independent filmmaker, um, I love um, learning from the beginning to the end. I also like to um, look out for people. That our our thing is that if we can, you know, like none of us, we got no one really said, hey, you know, here, hey kid, here's a break. I, I'm the one that believes in giving people a chance. You know, someone we said, you know what, you got the look, you know, you want to be an actor and stuff, or you know, have you done much? But let me tell you, I found people like when we I explained last time that uh, we had people cast and they dropped out the night before, and we got other people. They were ten times better than the people that I cast. So I believe in giving people opportunities and yeah, stuff, giving them their, their break um, because it was something I never got. So uh, I, you know, I'm I'm old school. You know, give people a chance. And I just like, I, I want to be able to do my own productions, um, basically take care of uh, or, um, people that I know, people who've been loyal, and just our own thing. And then just try to, you know, just be recognized as a, uh, as an Italian filmmaker, you know, you know, or an American filmmaker just to, uh, as an independent, made it on my own. You know, like as Sinatra would say, I did it my way. You know, I can't beat Hollywood. I can't uh, be a part of Hollywood. But you know what? Doesn't say I still can't follow my dream. Well, on the flip side, too, Frank, I don't think there's ever been a better time. And I'm being a little bit repetitive, but there's never been a better time to do it yourself. I mean, there's so much technology. There's so much uh, streaming and different companies out there looking for material that I don't think there's ever been a better time to create your own Oh yeah, and that's one of the things that uh, has basically been helpful for us is that I've been able to get three of my projects on uh, Film Hub. Uh, I can go directly um, uh, to the distributors through Film Hub, and I can get my stuff on Amazon Prime, Tubi, and other streaming services which we have because I currently have three projects on there right now. I have uh, the uh, Blue Iron, Shift, and the Devil's Playground, which is currently playing on um, YouTube. Right now, it's uh, one of our thir uh, short horror films, uh, you know, urban legend type uh, kid stories and stuff. But it's given me a direct access to the distributors without paying the big bucks and, you know, hiring an agent and paying 25000 for them to promote it. I can do it myself now. Yeah, it's amazing. It really is amazing. It really is. You never had, we've never had so much control or power like in the, in the independent uh, filmmaker's hands. Well, and also, and I was going to say for you as well, don't forget about the um, film festivals. Right. And you can promote yourself through the film festivals and and uh, do what I said. Um, basically, like I said, if you want to submit to certain film festivals, always uh, send a request asking for a discount code and tell them you're new, that you want to submit to your festival. Uh, hey, do you guys offer a discount code? Most of them will. And it's great because it, especially us uh, independent filmmakers, it's coming out of our, out of our pocket. Our budget's not high, and definitely trying to get some exposure will definitely help your project. Yeah, that's a good. That's a very good point, um, Frank. Well, listen, we're going to wrap, wrap it up soon. But where can we find you? I know we got you on Instagram as the Calabrian Kid. Anywhere else? You're on uh, yeah, on um, I'm on Twitter uh, under Blue Iron, and of course Frank Mancuso on Facebook. Pretty much, that's it. And then if we go to Calabria, oh well, if you want, you can also find you. you you can also find me on IMDb B page. <clears throat> you can see all the stuff that I've done there. <clears throat> and uh, let's see where else. Uh, Actors Access. I'm also on Actors Access. So I have a few uh, ways you can reach out to me and stuff. Oh, I'm also on um, LinkedIn, and I'm also on Inktip. Beautiful. Well, of course, we'll make sure we we add the links in the description box. So, friends, make sure you please you follow Frank and support all of his work. We're going to um, wrap it up, but I want to just encourage you also, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel right here, Vinny Presents. For those that are listening, please make sure you follow us, continue to follow us. And Frank, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to be with you again. We we worked on a project together. That's how I met you. And I can tell you where he is. Not just because you're color braids, but also because you're a good man. But you are a great man, Frank, and you're a great actor and, and obviously writer. And producer, so I wish you a lot of luck in in the future, and I hope uh, we are, our paths will cross again real soon. Absolutely, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure, friends. Again, thank you, and we'll see you next time.
Ciao.